Good morning, happy Sabbath. It is good to see some people in the sanctuary today. This was an interesting week for us. This week on Thursday morning after I dropped off my daughter at the school at Hinsdale Avenue Academy, I came to this church and I noticed right in the hallway that there was a flood of water. And I had to really use the restroom. Went to the restroom back here, uh, figured out that they didn't have any soap. So I'm like, let me go, let me try to find uh, a, a place where I can get soap, right? And so I, I, I tiptoed around the water, and thankfully the water wasn't too deep where I could walk in the restroom and use the restroom. We had a flood here this week. Uh, the crew came in, rem remediation team came in on Thursday morning, cleaned it up, and as you can see, those of you who are here, uh, it's, we're blocking it off because it's drying right now. And our hope is that by this, by this next week, by, by next week this time, uh, by next Sabbath, We'll be ready to go. We'll be worshiping with us. We'll be worshiping together for our hospital Sabbath. So pray for us uh, as we, as we uh, work hard to make sure that we can get this back to uh, functioning as fast as possible. Uh, one lesson I learned from this flood situation is the lesson of endurance, of persisting and adaptability. I mean, that's, that's what we've been learning about in this sermon series. Can you believe we are on the last message of our sermon series entitled Relationship Status. Seven weeks ago, we covered Single with a Purpose. Next, we covered Dating. The first of October, on October 1, we covered Newlyweds. October 8, Beautiful Biblical Sexuality. Then we covered Parenting with Patience. Last week, we covered To End or Not to End Divorce. And today, the title is Marriage for the Long Haul. Marriage for the Long Haul. What is the key to a lasting marriage. What's the key? What is the key to lasting marriage? Well, we're gonna find out from King Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. We're gonna be in Ecclesiastes chapter four, and in this book, we're going to discover that what the key is to a lasting marriage. Now, I do wanna say for those of us who are not married, uh, that this mess, just, just, just in case you're thinking, uh, you know what, I, I've been there, or I, I, maybe one day that's not for me, I, I want to say something. This message, there are principles in this message that are still for you. In fact, when Solomon wrote this in Ecclesiastes, he didn't, he didn't have uh, married people in mind. Have you been to a, a wedding and heard a message on Ecclesiastes chapter 4? I'm sure you have. I even have uh, given a wedding message, homily, based on Ecclesiastes chapter 4, especially verses 9 through 12. But just in case you're thinking, ah, this is, this is not for me, just stay with us. You're going to find principles that apply to you as well. But what we're going to do is we're going to look for some principles about lasting marriage in this text. And King Solomon gives us a clue right up front. So I'm giving you the message right up front based on what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. Look what he says. And you're welcome to turn there in your Bible. If you have a physical Bible, you have a digital Bible on your screen or on your phone or in a tablet, that's okay. You got to see this with your own eyes. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. Solomon says this, two are better than one. How many are better than one? Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. There it is. There is a secret to a lasting marriage. Two are better than one. Two are better than one. Or in other words, us is better than me. Say it with me. Us is greater than me. Us, this is what Solomon's saying. Us is greater than me. Me. Two is greater than one. Us is greater than me. And Solomon gives us at least three reasons why us is greater than me. Let's go. Back to verse 7. Chapter, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 7. We're going to find out three reasons, three reasons why us is greater than me. Three reasons why us is greater than me. Number one, let's go to verse 7, starting with verse 7. We'll read 7 through 9. Here's Solomon He's saying, again, I saw vanity under the sun. I mean, this, this is Solomon's autobiography. Toward the end of his life, 
looking back on his life and saying everything is vain and, and writing this, this philosophical treatise, this auto, autobiography about what really matters and where true happiness comes from and what is the meaning of life, all here in the book of Ecclesiastes. And he finds, he, he cites uh, uh, something that's vain. He says, I saw vanity under the sun. Here it is. Here's vanity. Verse 8. One person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil, and his eyes are never satisfied with riches so that he never asks. For whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. Then he says in verse 9, which we read already, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. You see, he, he says this is vanity. Look at this man. Verse 7, he cites three, at least three problems. Number one, uh, in verse 8, one, one person who has no other, either son or brother. So here's a man. He has no son, no brother. He has no family or friends. He is living for me, myself, and I. I am all alone. I am isolated. Now, it doesn't sound too different from our culture today. Western culture, modern culture today that is individualistic, right? Me, myself, and I, uh, it's, it's, it's Western culture at, at, at its best, right? Now, I, what I love about Western culture versus Eastern culture, so let's just take uh, f- traditional Filipino culture, which is the, the heritage of my parents from the East, all right? Uh, in the East, in, 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 in Asia, uh, family and community is primary, right? And so then to challenge family or to challenge your parents is, is a sign of disrespect because you want to save face for the community. But in the West, especially in the U.S. and Europe, or North America and Europe, uh, what's, what's most important is the person or the individual. And while we do appreciate independent thinking and questioning the very foundations of what we believe and questioning authority, I mean, that's okay. It's safe to do that, especially when you have unhealthy leaders The problem with independent thinking, individualism or independent thinking is that we become, uh, we think that we are independent in our relationships where we devalue relationships. And one example of this is the modern day garage, which is really a modern day cave. You work all day from, I don't know, eight to five, and then you drive home through traffic and the closer you are to the city, the more, the more impatience you have because you hit more traffic. And after a long day of, of being with your, your, your co-workers and, 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 and driving through traffic, you open up the door to your cave. You go into your cave. You close, your, you close the door to your cave in your garage. And you shut out society until the next morning when you go to work. Where in the last, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years, people, we, we no longer live in communities and neighborhoods where people know each other. We don't even know the neighbors. I mean, let's admit it. We don't know the name, the names of the, the, the five or six neighbors around our home. Why is that? Because our culture is isolated. It's very individualistic. We live in modern day caves called garages and homes. This man, he is all by himself. Solomon saying, one person who has no other, either son or brother. And look at his next problem in verse 8. He says, yet there is no end to all his toil. He just works and works and works and works and works and works and works. You know what that's called? Workaholism. Do you know what workaholism is? It's working and working and working and working and working. Your life is working. You go to sleep. You're thinking about working. You wake up to work. You get ready to to go to work. You're just thinking work, 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 work. Two or three years ago, there was a study done by the Vision Council. They they, they, uh, surveyed about 2,000 adults in the United States of America. You know what they said? Almost half of employed Americans, 48%, consider themselves modern-day workaholics. And then they cited 10 reasons or 10 signs to know if you're a a workaholic. I'll give you the top two. Here's the first one. This was at 54%. So more, just a little bit over 1,000 people said this. Here's the top sign. Prioritizing work before my personal life. 
Anyone here do that? Anyone here know people who do that? So you prioritize work before my personal life. So you think more about, about your work and how you, succeed, you can succeed at, at work versus your own health, your financial health, your physical health, your mental health, your emotional health, your social health. The second reason is worrying about work on a day off. I mean, do we really have a day off when we're thinking about that conversation and the drama that we had in the workplace? Do we really have a day off when we're thinking about, oh, I just can't, I'm going to have a busy week when I start on Monday. These are the top two signs of a workaholic. This man that Solomon's talking about, that he sees, he's all alone, no family and friends. Number two, he's a workaholic. And look at his third problem. It's, it's still in verse eight. And his eyes are never satisfied with riches. His eyes are never satisfied with riches. In other words, he's living for me, myself, and I. He is greedy. All he wants is money. Money to spend on himself. Money to build his wealth. Money to, to save and to spend on himself. Now, there's nothing wrong with saving. There's nothing wrong with wealth. But the only person that he thinks about is himself. And friends, if we live for money, we will never be happy because we'll never have enough money. We'll never hit that time where we're, we're like, yes, I have enough, and this is exactly what's happening to the man. Solomon is saying, this is vanity. Alone, workaholism, and the guy, this guy is never satisfied with riches. He's trying to grasp for satisfaction. He's trying to grasp for happiness. He's trying to grasp for pleasure, and he thinks he can get it in money, and the more he accumulates, he realizes that he is still empty, and he tries to, to work more and more and more, and I wonder, especially for this community of faith, I wonder about those of us who were immigrants from another country and came to America to work for the dream, for the American dream. There's nothing wrong with the word American dream. And yes, many of us have had this great privilege and this honor to be able to come to this country and to make a living in a place that's more economically and financially prosperous and to be able to send the money back home or back, back to our relatives who are, in, who are in need. I understand it and I get that. And there's nothing wrong with the motive to be able to work hard to help bless others, especially those who are less privileged. There's nothing wrong with that. But I do worry, I do worry and I question that can we be so focused? Have we been so, so duped by the American dream where we work, 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 not only for the other, but we're working for ourselves? Where maybe, maybe we've, 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 we've been so, so duped and, and so, uh, 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 so, so caught in this cycle of living for the next paycheck living for ourselves, living the American dream. Working for the American dream, friends, will suck the life out of you. Working for the dream will suck the life out of you. And this is exactly what's happening to this man because the text says this, one person who, who has no other, either son or brother, he's isolated, yet there is no end to all his toil. He's a workaholic. His eyes are never satisfied with riches. He's greedy. He's never getting happiness. And then it says, Solomon says, so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? In other words, I'm, I'm, living, I'm living for myself. I'm living for myself. I want happiness. But he's saying, for whom am I toiling? Who is joining me, Who is joining me in, this, in my work? Who am I living life with? I'm just living for me, myself, and I, and those of us here in the sanctuary, those of you who are watching online, could it be that a married couple could be living together, but you could be living only for yourself? Could it be that the person that you sleep next to is only, is only a roommate, but not your lover, your spouse, the one you dream about vacations with, the one you talk about your, great, your, grand, your greatest dreams and, and your, 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 your deepest struggles? Is it, very, is it possible that we can be so duped by, by we, can, we, could, we can be so duped by isolation, workaholism, and greed that even those of us who are married and in relationships are still living isolated lives? And we're working, we're asking, like, what's the purpose of life? Like this, this empty man, he's saying, for whom am I toiling with? Who, who, is, who is with me? Well, Solomon gives a solution. He says this. In verse, eight, verse, verse 9, 
He says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. You see what the reward is? He says in verse nine, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their world, for their, for their, their toil. That word for reward in the original language is wage. So what is the, wa- what is the wage that he gains? What is, the, what is the true reward of this man? Is it wealth? The true reward is verse 10. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. Meaning that the reward is not the money, the reward is not the result, the reward is the relationship. And this is why Solomon says that us is greater than me. Two is better than one. Our reward is not in money. Our reward is in the relationship. So reason number one why us is greater than me is because we have another. Reason number one why us is greater than me is because we have another. There is an other, another person. And if you're married, there is another person. If you're not, you have, maybe you're thinking about another person. Or maybe you're engaged or you're, you're thinking about a relationship. Maybe you're not even thinking about relationships. You can still be with an other by cherishing their friends, cherishing your church community. You can still have that. There is joy in having an other. You know, I found it interesting. This week, I interviewed, no, I didn't interview. I texted several couples that I know who have been married for, uh, for more than 40 years, asking them, hey, give me the secret. Give me the secret to a long marriage, lasting marriage, right? Marriage for the long haul. So this was written by Jesse and Beth Reyes. They've been married for 48 years. This is good. I love this. He says, I always place her happiness over mine. I believe that a happy wife is a happy life. We believe in the five C's of a happy marriage. He says, number one, Christ should always be at the center of our marriage. Two, communication is very important. Three, being considerate to each other is a key element. Number four, constructive criticism when one makes a mistake. Number five, courtesy or respect for each other. And just to add another one, and this is an extra one which I laughed at when I read it. He said, uh, C stands for cash. Put cash, at least $200 in her bag at least once a week, although you can't do this anymore when you're retired like me. (laughs) Uncle Jesse, if you're watching online, you're welcome to put it in my pocket as well. All right? I love that. I thought that was pretty cute, right? Where is this happiness coming from? It's not the cash. Yes, it's Christ, but communication, considerate, constructive criticism, courtesy. It's living not only for me, it's living for the other. Us is greater than me. Javier and Norma, Ellen Castro, they've been married 41 years. They said, God praying, fasting to get, praying and fasting together for, and for each other, that works. And you know what else they said? Uh, they said, quality time together as a couple. And then when someone does the little things for you, they can end up being very significant, demonstrating love, caring, and consideration in a big way. Alan Castro, if you're watching online, thank you for that reminder that it's the little things, right? It's the little things that count. I remember one preacher saying, I don't only give a gift to my wife on her birthday and Christmas. I even give her a Halloween gift. (laughs) The little things, right? The little things that that count. And then the quality time as a couple. Ooh, this hits home. I have two kids. I love my kids. Eliana, Emily, you're probably watching online. Five-year-old, two-year-old. And Catherine and I ask ourselves, quality time. We we, we, what do we have to do? Let's come on. We have to be, we, I have to be more intentional. I have to be more intentional. It's not, it's not going to work. Why? Because I'm not just living for myself. I'm living with and for another. Us is greater than me. We have another. Edmund and Wendy, they're sitting right here. I, at potluck last week, I said, hey, what's the secret? What's the secret, right? They said two things that I, I wrote down. Humility, and then I, I, I circled this. Remember the beginning. Remember the beginning. Remember the beginning when uh, you had googly eyes looking at her and looking at him? Remember that? Mm -hmm, This might be the one. Woo! She looks good. He looks good. 
And then that day when, when, when you saw her walking down the aisle and your lips, your mouth started salivating, even though no one else saw it? Wow. You remember the, the, the first week, first month of marriage? You'll go back. That's good advice. 41 years. You can go back 41 years and go back to the beginning and realize that I'm not living for myself, that I had an other 41 years ago. And I still have an other today. So reason number one why us is greater than me, we have another. Number two, verse 10. We already read it. Look what the text says. Solomon says, For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. The Hebrew word for fall can mean a physical fall, uh, like I did a few weeks ago. I hurt my knee while I was biking after the rain. Don't bike after it rains, okay? It's a bad idea. Uh, fall could, could mean death. The word in Hebrew could, either mean, uh, could also mean falling into the power of another. But the primary meaning of the word fall in the Hebrew is uh, a failure in one's undertakings. Or another way to put it would be evil circumstances that comes to someone. Now, Evil, evil circumstances that comes to someone. It, it, it reminds me of, of two wanderers in the desert in, in, in the Middle East. This is, this is the, the, this is, talk about 3,000 years ago. Wandering through the desert, no big backpacks, no uh, water bladder and, and tube to drink water, no, no, no uh, tent, Tiny, tiny tent poles, none of that. No facilities, no food, wild beasts. Can't go to sleep at night. You're all alone, you're, you're, you're on this journey, and you're, you are not safe. Uh, I was trying to think back to a time where I didn't feel safe. Uh, over two months ago, I went to Cancun, I know there are some uh, in, our, in our midst, and those of, those of you watching online, you, you just went to Cancun recently for a wedding. And uh, I was in Cancun and the island of Isla Mujeres, and I was with my three friends. We just saw some whale sharks. It was a, an amazing experience. And then the, the boat, before they came to, we went back home, stopped in this, this island called Isla Mujeres. It stopped there, and my two friends, John, and my brother-in-law, uh, Johnny, John and Johnny, they, they, they swam out. And, and, they said, and then they said, hey, Nestor, let's go. So I jumped in the water. It was, it was a break time. And the shore wasn't too far. But I decided, you know, I'm going to put my snorkel on, which, I, which was already problematic. Water was coming in. And I didn't have my, I didn't put my fins on. I said, you know, I'll, I'll just swim this. I'll just swim. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. And as I was swimming, uh, I'm not the strongest swimmer. Like, I can swim, but I'm not the strongest swimmer. And neither am I confident treading water for a long time. And there was this point where I reached this, this section with seaweed where I thought to myself, water's coming in. Am I going to fall? Am I going to make this? Water's coming into my mask. I looked up. Johnny and John were still far away. And I, I, I was fearing for my life. Where's my help? Where's my help? I'm so far. I was, I was going to scream their name, but I, I took some deep breaths, and I was, just, I was terrified for my life, and thank God I made it. I finally made it to them. It wasn't that far. But for some of us on this journey of life, whether we're single or even if we're married, there are times where we're so isolated, and we've fallen, and we're like, <sighs> and the help is too distant. It's so far. And Solomon says, you're not alone. Two is better than one. And when you're falling, someone can lift you up. And that's exactly what happened to us. That's exactly what happened to some of us when we were hiking in Colorado. We were hiking on Lone, to, to Lone Eagle Peak, one of the most beautiful sites I'd ever seen in my life just a few years ago. And on this hike, uh, one of my friends, he couldn't make, he never hiked like this before. It was like seven hours one way, uphill, tired. He was going to give up. But if it wasn't for the support, he would have given up. Reason number one, why us is greater than me, we have another. Reason number two, we have support. We have support. I don't know what, it was, what I was doing. I, I, never, I have never hiked that, foot mar that much before. I was wearing 40 pounds on my, on my, on my backpack. 
I didn't have a water filter to drink from the stream. But it was because God put other people in my life. They helped me out. I had support. In fact, notice what verse 11 says here. I, I found it interesting, this, this, this hiking analogy. Verse 11, again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? We finally got to our destination. And we couldn't see Lone Eagle Peak because the sun had already set. And I had this tiny tent with my friend Ian. We both took Tylenol because we were tired. Our feet were hurting. And, and uh, we had warm sleeping bags. But we were right next to each other. If you're by yourself, you're cold. But the closer you are to another body, you're warm. I had Ian, which is a good friend of mine. And I remember the first time I went camping with my family, with, with Catherine, my wife, and, and our firstborn, Eliana. She was excited. We have this, uh, this, this sleeping bag that ha that, that's like a, a, a two-man sleeping bag. If I'm in there by myself... I'll be okay, I'll still be cool, but because I was next to Eliana and because I was next to Catherine, I was warm. We have support. Roger and Beth, they've been married 50 years. And I said, what's the secret? You know what they said? God is the center of our marriage. We love and respect each other. In other words, we support each other. Our very own Uncle Bing and Auntie Eden sitting right here on the second row. They wrote, they've been married for 44 years. They wrote, what's the secret to a long-lasting marriage? By partnering in ministry. And they have this quote from Antoine de Saint, I don't even know how to pronounce his last name, Exupery or Exupere, whatever it is. He said, love does not consist of gazing at each other, but in looking outward together in the same direction. Let me read that again. Love does not consist of gazing at each other, but in looking outward together in the same direction, meaning that we are serving together and I'm not doing this alone, that we're gonna do it together. Reason number one, why us is greater than me? Because we have another. Reason number two, according to the text, we have support. Last but not least, number three, this is now in verse 12, first part. Notice what Solomon says as we come to a close. And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. i read that again. And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. If you're by yourself and a crazy moose is trying to chase you while you're hiking up in Colorado, you're gonna, you better run. But I'll never forget on that same hike with my friends to Lone Eagle Point, we saw a moose on the trail looking right at us, and we ran. And my friend, who has a license, was packing, and he pulled out his weapon and prepared for that moose to charge us. Thankfully, the moose went another direction, and we were safe. Listen, I took Taekwondo. I didn't make it past brown belt, okay? There's no way that I would take that, that moose down, all right? I thank God for my friend Chris who was packing that day. Because if you have one that's going up against an enemy, a moose, you're not going to make it. But if you have another one, if you have another person, you're stronger. So reason number three why us is greater than me, according to Solomon, is that we have strength. Two have strength. We have strength. But... But here's the reality. Sometimes a couple doesn't have enough strength. I found it fascinating, surprising actually. In the responses that I got from, from many, several people that I asked who were married for more than 40 years, what's the secret of marriage? You will see this common theme. You know what? Times get tough, but we're gonna, we make it. Times get hard, but we're just going to trust God through it. Times get really difficult, but we're going to make it. One person said, no, one person said this. This is uh, Uncle Ma and Auntie Beth, if you're watching online. 51 years, 51 years of marriage. Uncle Ma said, I believe in staying committed to your original vows and not let anything Anything break your love for each other. Always understanding and forgiving each other. Interesting that he says 
to not let anything, anything. He used the word twice. To not let anything, anything. Because after 51 years of marriage, you've been tested. I've been tested at nine years. Multiply that by five. 51 years. You've been tested. And that was the common theme that I saw from the advice from some of our members, some of our viewers, that the longer you're in it, the more storms you're going to experience and the more storms you're going to hit. There's, it's going to be stormy. And in those storms, the common word that I saw in the advice I was getting was the term forgiveness. Forgiveness. And it showed up right here in what Uncle Mott said. Always understanding and forgiving each other. Forgiveness. 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 Could it be that forgiveness is one of the secrets to making a marriage last for the long haul, to going the, long, going the distance in marriage? Forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. Why forgiveness? Why is forgiveness so important? Let me explain why. Your spouse does something that upsets you, right? And what happens is the, the only way to reconcile after uh, your spouse has offended you and has hurt you is by this act or by this, this action called forgive. The only way you're going to clear that is forgive. I like how Jesus said, especially in the King James Version, the Lord's Prayer, right? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? Give us this day our daily bread. And the King James says, and forgive us our trespasses, right? As we forgive those who trespass against us, right? And other version says, forgive us our, such of the D, a debt, as we forgive our debtors. What is a debt? When someone does, when your spouse or someone does something wrong to you, it creates a debt in your relationship. And the only way that you can be reconciled is if you can, if that, that debt is actually paid for. And the reason why couples struggle and why, 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 why they have a disagreement which turns into distance, a disagreement that turns into a distance, a, a, a disagreement that turns into distance, is because there is an unpaid debt that's still on the account, in the emotional bank account. And that, that debt is still there. That debt's still there. So what's going to pay for that? Yeah, you know what? He has to really pay. He has to get on his knees and, and crawl to me in order for that debt to be paid. Man, you don't know, Pastor. That debt that needs to be paid that my wife did to me, that is this close to being unforgivable. You have no idea. And in order for me to, to finally experience reconciliation and peace with, with my wife, is, is until she really pays for that debt. Until she really knows. And she really knows that what she did was, 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 was bad and that it, it hurt me to my core. No wonder I, 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 I gathered from those who responded that forgiveness is so important. And the question is, when you experience trauma, what about when the trauma is too, too deep? And, you, you, and you're, you're thinking like, there's no, she or he, my spouse, will never understand the, 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 the depth of the pain that I have and am experiencing right now. There needs to be justice in order for, for me to forgive. Friends, let me tell you, those of you watching online, the only source of justice is not going to be only from the confession of your spouse. The only place that you're going to find satisfactory justice is in this song. 
Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. He washed me white as snow. The only place you're going to find where that insurmountable debt is forgiven is in what Jesus did on Calvary. That's the only place. That's, that's the only place where you're going to find where that debt can be canceled. Jesus cancels that mountain-sized debt and gives us the ability to forgive when it's not possible. So where do I get love when I don't have any? Where, where can I get forgiveness when there's nothing in me that can forgive? And it's in this last phrase in Verse 12, and though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. And then Solomon, for some reason, inserts this in the text, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. The whole time he's talking about two people, two people, one, two, one, one, two is better than one, two is better than one. And then somehow Solomon inserts a threefold cord. And could it be, could it be that's an allusion to the idea? that there has to be someone in the center of our relationship in order for this to work, in order for me to forgive, in order for me to have the power to forgive another who has wronged me. The only place where I can find that and the only place where I can trust God's equity and justice for the trauma and the pain that I've experienced is, is in the fact that Jesus has paid it all. And as long as he's in the center, that if I have my cord and my spouse has her cord, she's a cord, when I have that third cord that's read by the blood of Jesus Christ, that third cord, which is God, a threefold cord, a threefold cord will not be quickly broken. It will stay together. God, my friends, is our strength. He is the center of our strength. This is amazing. Uh, our members here, my friends, Michael and Charmaine Schofield. He told me that his grandpa died at age 101, his grandma at page, age 99. You know how long they were married? 75 years. 75 years of marriage. I said, come on, Michael, tell me the secret. He said, it's a long list. Let me share a few things. And he shared this story that, 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 that touched my heart. He said, one piece of advice he got was, look for someone who is not selfish, one who is able to be humble. He said, Nana would tell me when working on the farm that she would try and go faster down the roads than Pop, than Grandpa, so that he would have less to do, even at 90 years old. He would go down the roads and do more work so that her husband would have less to do as he was aging. In other words, she was hurting herself, but her love was stronger. She was hurting herself, but her love was stronger. And in the place, friend, where you can't find that kind of love, there is a man whose name is God by the name of Jesus who hurt himself by taking your sin and my sin and the pain and the debts that people owe you, that your spouse might owe you, that your family members might owe you, that your enemies owe you. He has hurt himself because he loves you and he wants you to experience that kind of love. And Michael shared this poem with me. I thought it was fitting. When things go wrong as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high and you want to smile but you have to sigh, when care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Don't you quit. Go for the long haul. Why won't I quit? Because my Savior Jesus never has quit on me and he will never quit on me. Over and over again will he bless me. And it was Auntie Lita who's sitting here. She said, prayer, in other words, God is my anchor. As a praise team comes up, could it be that the words of Auntie Lita is true? That God 
is our only anchor. Let him be the third chord in your marriage. That was the common denominator, the common, common theme I saw too. That God is at the center, that God is at the center, that God is at the center, that God is my anchor, that God is my foundation. That's how we're going to make it. That's how we're going to get through. So let's trust in him. Let's believe in him. And friend, if you're watching, those of you who are here, we have a connect card, but we'll put this on for, the, for those of you who are watching online. You can pull out your phone and put, uh, uh, scan this QR code. There's a connect card. And if you're, if you're thinking, look, I, I, want, I want help. I, I, I need to talk to a pastor. I need help in my relationship. Write that in here. Write that in here. Uh, write that in the comment section right here, all right? Or write it online. We have, a, we have a, a section there for you. Or maybe you're thinking about beginning a relationship with Jesus, thinking about joining a small group. Write that in here. Put your name, your phone number, your address, your, your best contact. A pastoral team will, will, would love to be in touch with you. And we'd love to hear from you. Friends, let's make God our anchor and to trust in him and to love him because he loves us so much.